Professor Ben Recht, our next speaker, will be talking about uh, how to bridge the gap between the machine learning and the systems engineering. Thanks, Manish. I'm going to wait a second for this to pop up. This side seems good. Is it searching over here? Acquiring signal. All right. You have to love technology. <laughs> it is kind of one of these amazing things. It's been a very long time since I've given a talk and uh, I've plugged in the Mac adapter and it hasn't worked. So that's kind of one of these uh, um, miracles of modern technology. I'm sure uh, here at EECS we were responsible for some of that, or at least we should be taking credit. Um, and what I kind of want to lead with is that there are other things that I believe are in a kind of similar state to just plugging in your VGA adapter. Uh, and, and in some sense, it's basically everything we learn in machine learning classes. So the sorts of things that we end up uh, teaching our students, and we spend a lot of time in our, our course, we have a course here now uh, that we're trying to offer every semester called uh, EECS 189, uh, which Alyosha has done a, a lion's share of work with Jitendra Malik and kind of preparing. Uh, but at the end of the day, at more or less everything that we teach in that class uh, is now something that if you can just state the problem effectively, meaning I want to run nearest neighbors, I would like to train what is called a support vector machine, uh, or I'd like to uh, uh, um, even estimate uh, uh, very sparse images from kind of microscopy data, in some sense from an algorithmic perspective and even from a scaling perspective, we're kind of done. Uh, this has been something that we've been spending maybe the past 10 years on, it's been something I've been spending uh, a, a lot of, at least the last five years, thinking very hard about, is that once you have kind of an automatic declaration of these things that we can do in an undergraduate classroom, at that point we can kind of t tell ourselves, you know, now we have the algorithm, we know which algorithms work, we know which algorithms scale, and we've built many systems that actually can deploy a variety of these things, which, uh, including <coughs> classification engines, clustering engines, nearest neighbor engines, at very, very large scales. And I say this, I've only been at East, uh, uh, on the faculty here for two years, but before that I spent uh, uh, some time at the University of Wisconsin and with uh, Chris Ray and Stephen Wright, we actually built and deployed many of these systems. Uh, we had a particular algorithm that we were fond of, which was called stochastic gradient descent. Um, but in doing so, these kinds of algorithms uh, we know have been deployed. Uh, we, they, they're they're uh, at Google, at, at uh, Microsoft, at Twitter. Uh, and even at Oracle, people have implemented this, kind of these ideas to the point where a lot of these kind of basic tools that we kind of took for granted, um, kind of we don't really need to think too much about how to actually scale them. However, that doesn't mean we're done. Everybody's still kind of really concerned about how we deploy machine learning on very large data sets uh, that are commonly acquired in industry. Um, but I would argue the reason why it's difficult and the thing that we are constantly running into is because what we're actually taught as undergraduates, uh, has nothing to do really with what machine learning is in practice. And in fact, I think the, the lessons can be taken from uh, Alyosha's talk. At the end of the day, the algorithm he was proposing to do all of the kind of amazing things that he was showing uh, was just nearest neighbors. Again, this is a very simple thing. You would even learn this outside of machine learning. You might learn this in an algorithms class, how to do that effectively with tree structures and all sorts of things like that. Uh, but what really made uh, the problem challenging was figuring out all of the steps and pieces that you have to put together just so you can run nearest neighbors. You're never just handed some data and then you could just say, I'm going to run a support vector machine. Instead, what's typically going to happen is that you're going to have a bunch of steps that are required to actually get your data in any kind of reasonable state so which, that you can actually start thinking about these very simple algorithms. So you have these kind of pipelines of data processing steps where you have to kind of First, you know, crunch on some part of the data, grind on some other part of the data, and so on. And the fact of the matter is that as machine learning researchers, we can't say anything about just the basic elements of what we would do in software engineering. If I tell you something has about four or five stages, usually we, we spend all our time focusing on just this last box, ignoring this entirety of end-to-end -end, uh, design which is kind of the core of what we want to do if we want to build something that's going to be reproducible, that's going to be stable, that's going to be predictive. Uh, and, and, and so I think the main challenge for machine learning researchers, um, and I'm, I'm mostly a theorist, but I do kind of uh, 
talk to people who work in applications, and I also work very closely with people who are building systems. I think the biggest question in, in that intersection is how can we actually understand a modular theory of machine learning? So there are lots of challenges about how to actually optimize these kind of systems, how to prototype them and make it kind of more easy to deploy these systems. And uh, uh, to understand basically, it, we spend a lot of time understanding the basics of the stability of each building block, but we have no way of actually understanding what happens when we kind of plug them all together end to end. And trying to understand actually how everything's going to work together is a major challenge. So, I mean, to be very specific, actually, machine learning does kind of have a repeated pattern. There is kind of a, a, there is a thing that we always do, although we always just emphasize the very last stage. The first thing is just thinking about how we actually take this data that's in the natural world and turn it into ones and zeros. That's the acquisition period. Um, we then have to figure out how to take those kind of ones and zeros and make them into more usable states, throwing out a lot of kind of the noise in that acquisition process. Then we have to kind of select what we call features. Alyosha mentioned that word several times. We kind of take this for granted. Features are just like the stuff that we're actually going to be discriminative, telling us the difference between Paris and London. What was the one you used? Hog? Yeah, yeah whatever. So we'll come back to that in a second. <laughs> anyway, and then at the final stage, maybe then you get to run your classifier. And so as uh, it's kind of what was mentioned also again in Alyosha's talk, you know, you would take some vocabulary, you take a text document, and you would just turn that into a vector basically just a histogram of the words used in that document. Then you would run something called TFIDF, which is just a way of normalizing overly frequent words against not commonly occurring ones. Then you might run something like latent discriminant analysis if you were a Berkeley grad student, because that's, that's all the rage here and has been for 10 years. Uh, and then maybe you would run something akin to a conditional random field to do part of speech tagging or kind of uh, sentiment analysis or something similar. And the computer vision is kind of a similar story, I guess I can riff on Alyosha's talk here, where you might build something like a Laplacian pyramid, which is just some way of kind of hierarchically just splitting up the image. Then you might use hog or something similar to kind of get out some features that are not as sensitive as pixels. Uh, you would do some kind of matching or nearest neighbors. Oh, I just gave away a punchline. This thing is, okay. <laughs> you might run nearest neighbors, and then finally you get to do k nearest neighbors, right? Okay, so you run some matching actually locally on images, and then you run your k nearest neighbors. So I want to make something even more complicated, and I kind of was hinting at that before. So uh, I am a giant fan of football. I know that's a little bit of a controversial thing to be right now. Uh, certainly I know that there are lots of flaws with this game, but I do find it quite entertaining. I find it entertaining, uh, I have quite another thing to admit, I'm a fan of the New England Patriots. Uh, so <laughs> I, grew up, I grew up in, or sorry, the world champion New England Patriots, that's what I'm supposed to say. So uh, I, uh, I grew up in Western Massachusetts, and uh, I, I, I did participate in a decade of horrible, really embarrassing losses. So well, once they started being good in the mid-90s, it was, a, it was kind of a shock to everyone. Uh, so, uh, but I am a big fan of football, and as a result of being a Patriots fan, uh, and I think actually what's happened as people have, um, as, as you know, computers have evolved, there is kind of a analytic side to football in a similar way that there is to baseball. Although it's much more complicated because we don't get 162 games, you get 16. And so there are all sorts of questions in football uh, that, that are quite interesting. They're quite data-driven problems. For example, about how you can take particular players and figure out how they're going to fit into a particular system, uh, how, if they're actually going to be good for the kind of game that you run. Or if you have college, uh, you, you look at the college feeder league and you try to say, okay, who is actually the best guy who should go first on draft day? Or even if you just look on game day and you look at actually what happens inside of one of these plays, you know, it's, it's uh, well, I think it has a reputation of being a very meathead-driven sport. There actually is a lot of sophistication in what goes on into the strategy and planning inside of a football game. So what, what I plotted here, this is kind of a schematic for what one might do uh, inside of one play. It turns out that 90% of the plays that Peyton Manning, who's probably one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, runs are basically, they start from one idea. They have one concept that you start from. Essentially, this is the diagram. And he is a, because he is so intelligent and because he has so many different ways of disguising what they're going to do, they're actually able to be very effective, essentially just running one basic play. And so there's a, there's a wonderful analysis by a, a, an author named Chris Brown about this kind of particular play, if you want to read about it. He's, he's really good. So the problem with football at this stage of the game, there's our victory celebration here. Uh, the problem with football at this stage of the game is that actually to get the data, this is what's amazing to me. I mean, we're in 2015. How do these guys actually get the data? They, the, the biggest uh, 
websites, Pro Football Focus, Football Outsiders, there are a variety of these kind of analytics-minded people. They enter it by hand. They enter everything by hand. And some of these things are really hard to enter. For example, how long does it take the quarterback to throw the ball? You have to do that and you have to go in there and every frame figure out exactly how many frames are gone between he, before he releases it. Uh, and then you have to track all these different players and understand, I mean, the, on, on a game day, uh, there are 53 players on each team. So it's very, or 45 on game day, either way. So you have a very complicated kind of mess of all of these different plays and many details are left off and not recorded. And so we actually have a fairly unsophisticated, we've gotten much better in the last 20 years, but it's, uh, it's nowhere near what you get in baseball. And in fact, it's nowhere near what you get in basketball, uh, which is actually quite fascinating. In fact, basketball has had a bit of an analytics revolution in the last five years. Uh, part of that is because they've invested very heavily in, in computer vision. Uh, and, uh, actually, it's an Israeli company that builds a very, very precise way to track all of the 10 players on the court at all times. And this has kind of enabled a lot of teams to be smart, smart about who actually, you know, to do a little bit of a sabermetric style thing in, ba in basketball. And there's, uh, there are some suggestions that this kind of technology was what led to LeBron James having kind of this amazing season he had with the Heat two seasons ago. So kind of just like really completely reinvented the way he played when they went on that insane, was it 32 game win streak. So that, that was basically the thought was a lot of that had to do with analytics. Um, what I find particularly funny is that the, the company that makes these is an Israeli company, and you have to think that their funding did not come from basketball. <laughs> so, so <laughs> yeah, anyway. So, yeah, they use missile, missile detection cameras so, okay, for, for tracking these basketball players. So, in football, it hasn't quite gone there yet. It says football has a much larger playing field. You have a much kind of, like, the plays are much, uh, they're much more, uh, uh, staccato in terms of how they actually play and you have lots of substitutions. So it's not quite there yet. Also there is a little bit, it's still kind of a little bit of a conservative game there about how we integrate these things. Um, but what is very interesting is that, that the NFL has released what is called coaches tape. Coaches tape is another one of these uh, kind of esoteric things that football guys like to talk about, how much tape they watched in the given week. And what is, what is coach's tape? Coach's tape is like the most boring way to watch a football game ever. You have these two guys. One guy stands in the end zone. And one guy stands in the, uh, kind of up on the, um, in the luxury boxes. And they take views of the plays so that you get all 22 guys who are on the field in the frame as much as possible in every play. It actually does not, like, you know, when you watch, you watch the amazing, like, hanging camera thing that swings through a stadium, uh, that's, like, gives you such an uh, like, exciting view of the football game. Here are just, like, little dots, little blobs that run around. But this is what the players have to study to understand what, or try to figure out what the strategy of the team that they're going to be playing next is going to do. Uh, and they just decided to release all of it. Uh, you have to pay them, obviously. The NFL is a wonderful, they are really good at making money. This is probably what they're, <laughs> that's the thing they're best at. Uh, so you have to pay them. I think it's $60 a year. But then you can get, um, you need to get 640 by 480 of the coaches film. They're saying that they're going to have HD version of the coaches film next year. And so this is a quick way to get, as, a, you know, as is always the case, as you can see from uh, Laura's talk and from Alyosha's talk, if you start taking images, this is a very quick way to kind of like overload your hard drive. So a season is about 10 terabytes. Uh, and moreover, this, this is like really, the, the, the quality is pretty low. I think if you know, if you have a kind of hand annotation and if you've been watching this for 40 years or something, you're like Bill Belichick, you can obviously tell what everything is going to be and what, every, what everybody's going to be doing. Um, but but for, for for most of us, it's a little bit hard to actually go and watch tape and figure out what's happening. And I think the even harder thing is that if you're the coach, you know where every player is supposed to go. So you could tell when they do something wrong. But if you're me, or if you're an opposing coach even, well, certainly if you're me, I have no idea. It's like, I, I think typical fans think that, uh, think that a play is broken because of something when in reality it was somebody else missing an assignment. And you can watch this, and now you have to decipher what went wrong when a big play happens. Um, so we had this idea. Uh, it, was a, it was an off-season about two years ago. Uh, you know, it's, the NFL has a very long off-season, so basically now it's over. I'm kind of in the, had about a week of feeling really good because my team won the Super Bowl, and now I have nothing to do <laughs> on my Sundays <laughs> until, until uh, I guess, research. Oh, gosh. <laughs> grading homeworks. I don't know. Uh, Sundays are, you know. Anyway, so what do I do instead? Well, so we were like, well, okay, well, we have this coach's tape. There must be a way of actually just like automatically annotating it. This is just machine learning. This should be easy. 
Uh, and it turned out there was a, there's a paper um, that we found by some folks at, at Oregon State where they tried to do a little bit of this. So the Oregon State has a football team. They haven't been good in a long time, but that's okay. They still, uh, uh, <laughs> they still are definitely there. Pac-12, I know, here we go. They're, they're better than Cal. I mean, that's... <laughs> so, that's, that's <laughs> So here was the idea, and this I think was, was, was cool about this, I mean, what, one, we got, I got into this for very silly reasons, just because they released this coach's film, I was like, well, we should do something with it. But uh, once you start diving into it, I, I started to learn a lot about exactly how we start to build these kind of pipelines, and you really start to get a feel for how complex and, uh, these things get. Um, uh, and, and let me just kind of walk you through what they do. So they want to basically just track guys running around in the field. So the first thing they do is you take a camera where you know, it's clearly not aligned with an XY axis and you figure out, okay, where exactly is that oriented in 2D space? And the second thing you do is like at the beginning of the play, everybody lines up and based on some information that you might have, some metadata, you figure out where everybody is. Okay. And then finally, we would, uh, I'm just gonna be sporadic, I'm not gonna jump too ahead. You run maybe a, what's called a particle filter to track everybody. And at the end of the day, there are about five videos that are up on their website that look like this. And there we go. Got boxes around all the guys. And then they're dropping back. And they make a beautiful pass. And he's going to cut. Okay, great. <laughs> so let's look at exactly what kind of goes into this. Uh, the, you know, so the hard part was we sent them an email and said, hey, do you guys have code that we could like, use? We'd like to actually apply this to some other data set. This is actually another fun part about machine learning. The answer is, ah, oh, it's in a terrible state. Uh, we will hold, try to clean it up. But uh, yeah, not really, <laughs> not really. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, reproducible research is a difficult thing. The even worse thing now, actually, I gotta say, the worst thing now is that a lot of the big data research and machine learning is done in industry, and then they're like, oh no, we can't show you our data. So it's actually very weird that, they, that, that the industrial, uh, industrial influence can guide research, but in some sense, you can't actually check if what they're saying is true. It's a little bit of a tricky and weird thing, but whatever, academics have this problem too. We actually hide things from each other all the time. Um, don't, I'm not a fan. So, let's, so we tried to figure it out. So like, all right, this should be easy. This is just like panorama matching. Photoshop kind of does this, right? So we figured we could just go through and do this. Here's what a view looks like. Is there, I have a play, and here I have my play re-rendered down in kind of two dimensions. So everybody kind of gets long because of my perspective transformation. But you can move around. And he's running, and he gets tackled, and that's the end of the play. Okay. This is like the two positive plays that Oregon State made that year. Uh, so, <laughs> so here's actually how that works. So I said we had three stages, right? We had three stages to actually do our tracking. Each one of those is a pipeline in itself. And you're gonna see there's like turtles all the way down as we kind of keep running through this, right? So basically you have to, uh, I'm gonna walk you through the steps. Bas you find uh, what are called key points that are kind of fe little features on the field that are kind of good to say two subsequent frames are, these are the same. And then you uh, create features and you run Alyosha's uh, favorite algorithm, the nearest neighbor's algorithm, and then you compute a perspective transformation to kind of warp the images from one to the other, and then you mix everything together and you make a beautiful picture. Okay, something like that. So here's NFL coaches tape. We're like, hey, we're gonna start with a different video. We're not gonna take these things that these guys did in Oregon State. And we're gonna actually just try to recreate the football field. And there's some guy running and then he gets tackled. What's nice is that when you have kickoffs, you pretty much get three quarters or, or 80 percent of the field, and so you actually could get a sense for how well this works. This was a great game, by the way. The, one we're, the main example we're using here was the one where uh, this is the last regular season game when Adrian Peterson, oh no, big villain now, but at the time, kind of a heroic guy, almost broke the single season rushing record. So, so here, here, here's where I started to learn computer vision. You know, I thought that this was a uh, and, and, and you quickly learn computer vision is, uh, I mean, he's not listening, so I can say this. Uh, <laughs> computer, computer vision is, 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 a, is a mess of choices. Every single thing you do, there are 15 or 16 CVPR papers about what you should do, and there's just no clear guidance as to it's what art. any of them are. It's art. <laughs> well, you know, that's certainly the way you do it. That's certainly the way you do it. Yeah, so maybe that's one way to approach it. It's art. So there's this thing where basically you have to find these key points, these markers that are good on the field. And so you go to the Wikipedia page for how to select key points, there are 12 options. On the Wikipedia page, this is not even going through proceedings, right? This is so, okay, great. Uh, and then you run it and you're like, okay, there are three key points. It's like, those are horrible key points. Uh, it would be really good to have them more spread out. And so then you go and read and you're like, oh, you have to actually make sure that if you pick one key point, then you throw out everything else in the neighborhood. And then you get, oh, come on, stop taping. 
something's bad. OK. So, that th so if you make sure that you throw out all the guys who are kind of in the neighborhood of the first ones, you can get a much better selection. And it turns out actually the best things, and you do find these automatically, are the markers on the field. They're there for a reason. They're good anchors. Um, all these things in boxes, I just kind of want to say, on the next few slides, I have all these things in boxes. This is this kind of thing where we're saying, if you compose it as an optimization problem or look at the math problem, you're done. So I put these things in boxes. To me, that looks like every talk I see by a computer systems person where they put a code snippet up. OK, it's just French or, or Chinese or something up there. You don't have to worry about it. Just say, look, that part's done. That part's done. I found the equation. That means I can run it. And I know how to run it at a scale. The hard part now, again, is stitching and putting these things together. OK, and then you have to match features. And again, now there's 15,000 different ways everybody's favorite feature detector. And you have to figure out which ones are good there. We end up using something called Daisy. They all have silly names. Uh, and then you could actually match. And you see that the best matches, again, are actually on these markers on the field. I guess I should have known that, but uh, not obvious at the time. And then you do something called graph cuts, and you get these things stitched together. And then, lo and behold, you get a panorama. Right? And this is what we were trying to do. It became less, I mean, we started off actually just wanting to work, make this work. And then we were just started to say, can you actually make computer vision reproducible? Meaning like actually go through and just plug these in and just have it work? And the answer is sort of. But of course, we, we use something called OpenCV, which was kind of the best open source computer vision platform that allowed us to kind of have this, uh, this panorama. And in using OpenCV, yeah, I mean, it, can, it kind of does have the right mapping on the field in 2D, but it took 10 hours on a single machine just for one <laughs> stupid play. Uh, so, so there's another problem. So obviously, we could optimize this particular we could optimize this particular step of the process, but this gives us one part of this very complicated pipeline, and we're kind of doing all of this ridiculous engineering just to make this work. And the question is actually like, you know, how do we scale this process of design, of kind of putting things together and actually doing integration from end to end for a task we want to do? We could, we could think really hard about football, or we could just think, you know, how do I build these pipelines? And so actually the answer is not really a machine learning answer, it's a computer systems answer. And that's what we do is identify the fact that we have repeated patterns. And so all of these things that we did just for this particular pipeline, there's some, I mean, again, th this is just basically signal processing, which is written in red. The blue thing is optimization, actually probably what I'm an expert in. This is something I know how to do. This is all those boxes I said, hey, trust me, if those are done, those are solved. And then the final thing is just basically combinatorial optimization, but here I just really mean algorithms, kind of really boring stuff that you kind of already would have learned as a, as a junior. So, Again, that's the kind of like our, our, our idea here is once we find these primitives, we can build the appropriate abstractions that make these things optimized and now couple them to the, the kind of stuff that we already know, this optimization toolkit that we've already designed. So there are lots of challenges. I'm going to kind of leave football behind for a second. Let's say, okay, so that was a good example. It's a running example. It gets very complicated very quickly. Uh, what are the challenges actually to do this in general? So we've been at AmpLab kind of actually focusing pretty heavily on these parts, uh, the parts of actually how, how you would actually do modular machine learning design. So the first one is, you know, the kind of uh, building the necessary building blocks for the particular substrate that you want to run on. At the AmpLab, we've been doing this in Spark. At Wisconsin, we worked on doing this inside of a, um, any, any uh, a relational database. Um, we also kind of looked at just doing this on large single machines. Again, each substrate, each computing substrate, you have to kind of figure out its own uh, optimization and building blocks, but that's fine. So we've been working on lots of different things there. Um, the second thing is now simplifying the, uh, the uh, ability for all of us to actually put these pipelines together, prototype these pipelines, try the different choices of the 12 different flags in every different Wikipedia page, and see what actually works well. And finally, I think another kind of grand challenge, and now this is more on the mathematical side of things, is trying to build this modular theory of machine learning, trying to understand <coughs> What, is you know, what exactly is this thing going to do, and how is it going to work in a repeatable fashion? How much time do I have? Perfect. Great. So let, let me dive through each of these and like kind of highlight three of the projects that are currently running in the AMP Lab um, and, and kind of say where we're heading in this direction. Okay, so the first one is optimizing the primitives. Um, I'm kind of flagging th three of our stars, uh, two star students and one star postdoc for this one. So this, this is something that Shivram uh, Venkataraman has been kind of uh, leading the effort on 
Uh, actually, he's just, he's just started actually on the basic linear algebra optimization packages, kind of just reproducing BLAST as kind of a zeroth order step. And from that, we're going to go and actually do distributed optimization. Although it, I, I do have to say, the number of the tasks that I described that reduce to just solving a system of equations is pretty large. So if you do this, actually this gets you about 85% of the way there. And then you plug this together, and then we can start doing the more complicated things that, that Laura was talking about uh, in her talk. And so what we're doing is actually, we have actually an open source release of this. It's part of uh, uh, the latest version of Apache Spark. Uh, this allows you to kind of just pretty, pretty seamlessly put together uh, uh, linear system solves. And, and Shivram uh, has, has nice ways of, uh, what he's working on now is um, kind of taking advantage of cloud elasticity so that you can actually build very balanced systems. And he has some, some initial results that are right, very cute where he can actually compete with supercomputers on solving many instances of these A AX equals B problems. So that he can actually, by, by just taking advantage of the fact that there is so much diversity in what you can set up inside of uh, EC2, you can actually get better performance numbers than you can on a, on a highly optimized supercomputing system. So the second uh, student who's, who's been playing a big role in this has been Evan Sparks. Uh, Evan's been working on kind of uh, the domain-specific language for kind of stitching together these pipelines, tuning their parameters, uh, and kind of ex exposing the appropriate parts about how to do plug-and-play uh, pipeline design. So he's, he's using a bunch of ideas from functional programming to change these kind of nodes together. Uh, and what this allows us to do is basically get a graph of what the computation is going to look like and allows us to change nodes out fairly, fairly easily. So this thing that I put up here, this is actually, this is a relatively simple pipeline from computer vision that's just used to do object detection. One of the simpler ones, it doesn't work that well, but it, you know, at least gets you kind of part of the way there. And even here, you have all these bunches of different steps. Uh, and an open source version of this is coming very, very soon. Uh, and finally, there's a third project, uh, Laurent Lessard, who is a, a postdoc, he was actually a postdoc in mechanical engineering, but you know, computer science is corrupting everybody. <laughs> so he's actually kind of been branching out a little bit. So Laurent is that what, uh, works in control theory. And that's kind of his, what he studies and what he's an expert on. Uh, and control theory, I guess, we all think is just the study of autopilot, making sure that planes don't crash, and similar things like this. Um, but control theory actually, you know, the, 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 at the end of the day, how, what happens when I design a new airplane? Well, you build a bunch of different building blocks. That's, each, that's an engineering team behind each building block. And then when you actually release your design, you release this like 800 page Simulink printout that's going to certify this thing won't crash in the storm. Right. Each block is built independently, and then we're, but we're somehow able to certify the end-to-end -end behavior. So we've been trying to think about, can we do that for machine learning? Can we in a similar way say, here is our certification. Every building block is built independently. Each of my engineering teams is going to make me promises about what these blocks are going to do. And hopefully, I guess we're going to trust them. But it, just under the assumption that they've actually built it correctly, that their spec is true, can we actually guarantee end-to-end -end performance? And this is the kind of thing we have some very preliminary results on, uh, where we're actually able to um, analyze a bunch of very common optimization algorithms that people use uh, in numerics, and actually sh kind of automatically generate certificates of stability and robustness. And this is using techniques, basically similar techniques that people use to kind of certify formation flight and similar techniques uh, and similar kind of systems and controls. Whoa, this, this uh, clicker is very happy today. All right, so the, uh, to sum up, right, we're, we're kind of making our, making our jump at, at these kind of three different bullet points, trying to figure out how to actually do global optimization on all sorts of different computing platforms, figuring out how to actually make the design of these systems easier, taking advantage of tools from functional programming and database languages, and actually certifying things mathematically so that, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're, we have a lot of talk coming out of a lot of companies saying that we're going to put machine learning things, machine learning systems in like cars and the smart grid and all this kind of stuff. And if we have mission critical tasks like that, I'd also like to have some kind of guarantee that it's not going to just decide that it sees a cat because you know, those may be the only images that it has access to. So we really want to have, if we have mission critical uh, tasks and we're going to do data-driven approaches, we need kind of certificates that these things are not going to have bad behavior. Uh, and, and, and that's the, the final piece of this puzzle that we're working on. So with that, I'll stop there and I'll take any questions you might have. And if you want, I can show you some videos of football, but either way, <laughs> thanks.
thank you. Very, very interesting. Uh, I have a quick question, and that is, you mentioned Simulink, that you have these modules, basically, and then you can change it and see what's going on. Are these modules in Simulink associative? Because one of the things that is coming up these days, and Siemens has uh, their yeah. NX, and as you know, and uh, Dassault has their uh, thing. Right. The associativity is a key factor, that if I change something in this module, it may affect these other ones, and I don't want to go and revisit each one of them and modify them. Uh, I like to look at them to just make sure they're okay, but if there is any minor modification or whatever, it does it by itself, so the integrity of my whole system is not compromised. Is that feature? That's, that is the idea. Now certainly with the stuff that I've been uh, working on with Laurent and also with Andrew Packard, who's in mechanical engineering, that's kind of an assumption that we're building in, is that you're putting these bounding boxes around things and that actually pulling those out, pulling out each component themselves, has this property like you said. It's basically we're, we're, we're treating that box, I mean, I, in some sense what you always do when you put these things together is you treat that box that says, these are the guarantees about the box, the specifics don't matter. All you care about is what happens to go in, and what happens to go out, and I promise you it won't deviate too much. So in that regards, it's, it's okay. But you're totally right that you can get much more complicated engineering designs with multiple feedback right. loops where this is not quite as cut and dry. Because Boeing, like many years ago, was involved in an uh, EPRI and <laughs> so on. They, a modular modeling was very hot, and that was exactly it. So you, you give me the module, and you give me the input and output, and I can just plug it in. Uh, but then it evolved into associative modular modeling, which is the key thing because you have so many modules, and you don't want to, when you change something, go back and uh, do that. Uh, uh, I guess my quick question is that, is Simulink working towards that oh. end, or you uh, working with them? In sorry, that sorry I used that buzzword, because I know lots of people end up talking to MathWorks. I use Simulink just because I know that there are airline companies that actually do use that. Uh, yeah. We're not using Simulink. Okay, so you have your own... Yeah, we're doing... Yes, yeah, sorry. That's, Thank uh, you. That's, sorry for that confusion. 